Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students This is Professor Ravin Zugade from Department of Chemistry Rashtra Santa Tukhadaji Maharaj Nagpur University Welcome back to this course on BSc Semester 1 UGC Curriculum of BSc Chemistry Honours Syllabus. In this module, we are discussing about oxidation and reduction. It is the last topic of this particular paper in your syllabus. This lecture has been prepared under the academic expertise of Professor L.J. Paliwal. Let us start with some important definitions corresponding to uh, this particular topic. Let us start what is meant by oxidation and reduction. Now, in the old days, certain definitions were put forward and they were used very commonly uh, in day-to-day -day practices. So, we will see what are the old definitions and what is the new definition of oxidation and reduction. Firstly, oxidation was considered as any process where there is a gain of oxygen atom while the reduction is exactly opposite to that that is the loss of oxygen atom was considered as a reduction process for example if you consider this reaction between fe2o3 and carbon monoxide this is a common process used in the metallurgical extraction of iron from the iron ores now the resultant species are ferrous that is iron in the form of the atomic iron along with carbon dioxide. Now we can see that there is a transfer of oxygen atoms from Fe2O3 to CO thereby Fe2O3 is undergoing loss of oxygen atoms and the process is called as reduction of Fe2O3 to Fe while carbon monoxide is gaining one oxygen atom which is called as oxidation process gain of oxygen atoms. So this is a redox process consisting of reduction of Fe2O3 and oxidation of CO. This was the first definition of oxidation and reduction. Another definition of oxygen oxidation and reduction is Loss of hydrogen can also be considered as an oxidation while gain of hydrogen is considered as a reduction process. This can be very well used in organic reactions. For example, we have ethanol molecule, ethyl alcohol, which is giving out two hydrogen atoms to give you CH3CHO, which is acetaldehyde. Now, loss of two hydrogen atoms will be called as oxidation process. At the same time, if we consider this acetaldehyde gaining two hydrogen atoms getting converted to ethanol, the process will be called as a reduction, which is gain of hydrogen. So loss of hydrogen and gain of hydrogen are considered as oxidation and reduction processes. Third and probably the most important definition of oxidation and reduction is in terms of electron because in terms of oxygen or in terms of hydrogen, the reactions are limited. But in terms of electron, when we try to explain oxidation and reduction, it becomes a universal type of uh, definition. Loss of electron is considered as an oxidation process, while gain of electron is considered as a, a reduction process. For example, if you have Cu2 positive, that is cupric ions, reacting with magnesium atom to give you copper atoms and magnesium ions. Now in this case, Cu2 positive is accepting two electrons from magnesium, thereby getting reduced to Cu. So this is a reduction process. At the same time, we can say that magnesium is taking, uh, giving up two electrons to Cu2 positive, thereby undergoing oxidation. In this particular case, we can define oxidation reduction in a different format. For example, we can say that the decrease in the oxidation state is called as a reduction 
increase in the oxidation state is called as oxidation so here cu2 positive is having plus 2 oxidation state cu is having zero oxidation state so from plus 2 to zero so reduction in the oxidation state is called as a reduction process increase in the oxidation state will be called as a uh, uh, oxidation process so this is how we can define oxidation and reduction in different forms or different formats along with this there is another concept of oxidizing agent and reducing agent now what is an oxidizing agent it is any species which oxidizes the other species while reducing agent is a species which reduces the other species oxidizing agent while oxidizing the other species it has to undergo reduction itself while the reducing agent has to undergo oxidation itself at the same time or we can put it in different format like any electron acceptor species will be acting as a oxidizing agent itself getting reduced and oxidizing the other species we will see the same reaction for example if we have cu2 positive ions they are accepting two electrons from magnesium thereby they are undergoing reduction themselves at the same time they are oxidizing magnesium from mg0 state to mg2 plus state and so they are causing the oxidation of magnesium so cu2 positive will be called as a oxidizing agent at the same time magnesium will be called as a reducing agent because mg is causing reduction of cu2 positive converting it or reducing it to the elemental or metallic copper so we can say that cu2 positive is a oxidizing agent and magnesium is a reducing agent another important definition is what is meant by an oxidation state now the number of electrons lost gained or shared by an atom during the formation of molecule will be called as its oxidation state in that particular compound if the electron is lost then oxidation state is positive and if the electron is gained the oxidation state is taken as negative an electron is always counted with the more electronegative atom of the bonded atoms oxidation state of an atom can be different in different compounds certain molecules have different oxidation state of a particular element certain molecules have different oxidation state of the same element some of the oxidation states of all the atoms in a neutral molecule is equal to zero while sum of oxidation states of all the atoms in the ion is equal to the total charge on that ion oxidation state of any element in the free uncombined elemental state is equal to always zero and oxidation state of fluorine in all the compounds is always minus 1 because it is the most electronegative element so when fluorine forms any compound with any other element its oxidation state is always taken as minus 1 oxidation state of hydrogen is generally plus 1 except in hydrides where it is minus 1 because in hydrides the hydrogen is combined with more electro positive species than it then oxidation state of alkali metals is always plus 1 while the oxidation state of oxygen is generally 2 except where in case of peroxides where it is equal to minus 1 and in superoxides it is equal to minus 1 by 2 now these are the rules of oxidation states we will discuss or we will try to explain or i will try to explain all of these rules on the basis of certain examples so we will go through a few examples to understand these rules okay let us count the oxidation states of various compounds so if you have h2 cl2 o2 etc now in all of these they are elemental states they are not combined hydrogen in case of h2 in case of cl2 in case of o2 they are not combined with any other element so the oxidation state of such elements or in the elemental state it will be taken as zero another example is metals like copper manganese iron in their elemental state oxidation state will be definitely zero certain elements they exist as uh, polyatomic molecules like p4 phosphorus exists as p4 sulfur exists as s8 but still they are in their elemental state so their oxidation state is taken as equal to zero 
coming to some ionic compounds like suppose NaCl. So now this NaCl is formed by combination of Na positive and Cl negative ions. So the oxidation state of Na will be plus 1 and Cl will be minus 1. In case of MgCl2, another ionic compound, Mg oxidation state is plus 2 and both the Cl atoms are in minus 1 oxidation state. So overall charge on the compound is equal to 0 because it's a neutral molecule. Coming to AlCl3, now in this case one Al atom is combined with three chlorine atoms and chlorine is more electronegative than aluminium. So we can say that aluminium is in plus three oxidation state and all the three electrons which are combined with aluminium, they are taken up with chlorine and so the oxidation state of chlorine is taken as minus one. Considering the covalent compounds like FeO, now Fe is less electronegative than oxygen. So the electrons are count with, counted with oxygen. So oxygen is in minus two oxidation state. So Fe should be in plus two oxidation state. MnO2, now you have two oxygen atoms. Oxygen is generally in minus two oxidation state. So both oxygen are in minus two oxidation state. And in order to make a neutral compound, manganese must be present in plus four oxidation state. Al2O3. Oxygen, three oxygen atoms in minus two oxidation state. So there are six negative charges on the three oxygen atoms. In order to neutralize the six negative charges, there have to be six positive charges on the two aluminum atoms. So both Al atoms should be in plus three oxidation state so that the total charge on this compound is equal to zero. Coming to another compound like HCl. Now in this case, chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. So electron is counted with chlorine. So Cl is in minus one oxidation state and hydrogen as obviously in most of the compounds, it is in plus one oxidation state. Another compound like H2O. Now oxygen is more electronegative. So two electrons are counted with oxygen. So oxygen is having electronic, uh, the oxidation state minus two while hydrogen plus one. So both hydrogen in plus one oxidation states. In case of NH3, we have three hydrogen atoms in plus one oxidation states. So the nitrogen should have minus three oxidation state, obviously because nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Now this is a special case where oxygen is existing as in minus one oxidation state because it is peroxide. So in case of hydrogen peroxide or sodium peroxide or potassium peroxide type of compounds, we have uh, hydrogen in plus one oxidation state here and oxygen in minus one oxidation state. We should keep this in mind. In case of LiH, now lithium is more electropositive than hydrogen. So, or in other words, we can say hydrogen is more electronegative than lithium. And there is a single bond between them. So electrons are counted with hydrogen. And so hydrogen is in minus one oxidation state while lithium is in plus one oxidation state. And this will be a situation in case of uh, compounds like sodium hydride, L NaH, or uh, uh, compounds like KH, potassium hydride, etc. This is another interesting compound. You have a KO2. Now K is always in plus one oxidation state. There is no other oxidation state for alkali metals. And so K is in plus one oxidation state. And in order to neutralize this plus one, these two oxygen atoms should have combinedly minus one oxidation state. So each oxygen atom is in minus one by two oxidation state. This is an interesting compound where oxygen is showing plus two oxidation state because it is combined with fluorine atom. Now fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen. So each fluorine is in minus one oxidation state. So oxygen should be in plus two oxidation state. Okay, now we will try to uh, calculate oxidation states of certain elements uh, which have a tendency to show different oxidation state in different compounds. For example, just now we have seen manganese is showing plus four oxidation state in MnO2. Now this is a compound which is KMnO4. Now we can calculate the oxidation state of various elements. Now among them, K being alkali metal, so it has a common oxidation state of plus one. Oxygen has a common oxidation state except peroxides and superoxides. It is equal to minus two. So K is in plus one. Oxygen is minus two. We want to calculate the oxidation state of manganese. So let us try to calculate this. Now, in order to calculate this, 
we will have to add all the charges on the compound and since it is a neutral compound the total sum of all the charges should be equal to zero now k is in plus one oxygen is in minus two let suppose this manganese has an oxidation state of x now this means that the charge on k is equal to one positive plus charge on manganese is x plus four times charge on oxygen which is equal to minus two this should be equal to zero indicating that this x should be equal to plus seven it means that the oxidation state of manganese in kmno4 is plus seven then only the sum of all the charges will come out to be zero another example is kclo3 now as obviously potassium is always in plus one oxidation state oxygen common oxidation state is minus two let chlorine has oxidation state of x so again we will add one positive for potassium x for chlorine and three into minus two for oxygen making the sum of this equal to zero so x is equal to plus five indicating that this chlorine is showing plus five oxidation state in kclo3 and we know that chlorine has a tendency to show oxidation states from minus one to it can it is since it is a, a halogen atom it can go up to plus seven so plus five is the oxidation state of this chlorine in this particular compound then another important compound in terms of oxidation or redox reactions is k2cr2o7 now in this case potassium is always plus one oxygen is in minus two let this chromium is equal to x now in that case we want to calculate the sum of that so total two into plus one plus two into x plus seven atoms of oxygen into minus two sum comes out to be equal to zero so this now 2x will be equal to 12 so x is equal to plus 6 indicating that this k2cr2o7 has chromium in plus 6 oxidation state and we know that chromium has the highest oxidation state plus 6 because of the six electrons present in 4s plus 3d kclo4 another interesting compound in the redox reactions potassium per iodate now this potassium is in plus one oxygen four oxygen atoms each in minus two and suppose iodine is in x oxidation state then we can say that one plus x plus four into minus two is equal to zero indicating that x is in is equal to plus seven or we can say that iodine is present in plus seven oxidation state and we know that this is the maximum oxidation state shown by any halogen element so this is how we can calculate oxidation states of various elements in different compounds many elements have a tendency to show different oxidation states in different compounds there is another important uh, concept of what is called as a electrode potential now when an electrode is dipped into an electrolyte solution it has a tendency to either lose or gain electrons and this leads to a process of oxidation or reduction at the electrode electrolyte interface the tendency to lose or gain electrons when in contact with its own ions it is called as a electrode potential for example consider this metal m in dipped in the solution of its own ions which are m suppose one positive two positive or in general n positive charges now whenever you have a metal in contact with its own ions it has got two processes or two tendencies the metal has a tendency to pass into the solution in the form of metal ions thereby leaving behind the electrons at the electrode surface or at the same time the metal ions from the solution have a tendency to accept electrons from the electrode and get converted into m now if the rate of this reaction and rate of this reaction now this reaction is or is generally called as de-electronation reaction or we can we generally call it as a oxidation reaction because it's a loss of electron in the second case this is called as a electronation reaction or generally we call it as a reduction reaction because it is a gain of electron 
Now, if the rate of oxidation and reduction are equal, then there will not be any charge on the electrode surface. But it is generally not equal in both the cases. If the rate of oxidation is faster than the rate of reduction, in that case, more electrons will remain on the electrode surface. And as a result, the electrode will bear a net negative charge. If on the other hand or on the contrary, if the rate of reduction process is faster, in that case, this Mn positive ions will accept electron very rapidly. As a result, the metal rod will lose the electrons and thereby it will bear a net positive charge. So, in some cases, the electrode is positively charged. In some cases, it is negatively charged. The net charge present on the electrode leads to a potential and that is called as a electrode potential under those conditions. Now, if oxidation takes place with respect to normal hydrogen electrode, which is taken as a standard reference electrode, it is called as a oxidation potential. While if reduction takes place, it will be called as a reduction potential. When I say potential, it means that it is the ability or tendency. Now, if the metal electrode is dipped in the solution of its own ions, having the unit activity, or we can say that the concentration is one molar and temperature is 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin, the electrode potential will be called as standard electrode potential. And if electron involved gases, then pressure has to be one atmosphere instead of activity one molar. The standard electrode potential is denoted by symbol E0. This is E with superscript 0, normally pronounced as E0. If we arrange the standard electrode potentials of various elements in the decreasing order of the reduction potentials, then the series which is formed is called as a electrochemical series or EMF series. We can see that among them, fluorine is at the top while lithium is at the bottom. What does it indicate? It indicates that fluorine atom have the highest tendency to accept electrons, thereby getting converted to fluoride ions. It is quite obvious because fluorine is the most electronegative element in the periodic table. And so it has a very strong tendency to accept electron and fluorine gas has a very strong tendency to get converted to fluoride ion. And it is expressed in terms of the reduction potential is found to be the highest value in the entire series at 2.87 volts. On the opposite side of this, lithium is having the highest tendency to accept uh, the electron, sorry, the lowest tendency to accept the electron. And on the other hand, it has got a, a reduction potential of minus 3.04 volt, which means that the oxidation potential of this solid lithium to release the electron and get converted into Li positive will be positive 3.04. Oxidation potential and reduction potential, they are equal in magnitude and opposite in sign. Now, at the center, we can see that there is hydrogen with a standard electrode potential equal to zero volt. Now, this is taken as a standard reference electrode and all the other reduction and oxidation potentials, they are calculated on the basis of hydrogen considering as or given an arbitrary value of zero volt E0 value. Now, what is the application of this electrochemical series? The first application of this is determination of cell EMF. Now, it is possible to calculate EMF of the cell by using this series using the equation cell EMF is equal to E of right hand electrode minus E of left hand electrode. Now, when I say E of left hand or the electrode potential, I'm always talking about the reduction potential according to IUPAC system. So, ER and EL are the EMF of the two electrodes of an electrochemical cell and knowing the values of ER and EL from the electrochemical series, one can calculate the cell EMF. Let us consider an example. If we have solid zinc rod and um, in contact with zinc ions and cadmium rod in contact with cadmium ions, suppose this is the reaction which is going on. Zinc in the solid state, 
reacting with cadmium ions in the aqueous phase giving you or undergoing a redox process giving you zinc ions and cadmium solid for this particular electrode uh, for this particular process the standard cell can be shown as zinc in contact with zn2 plus ions and separated by porous partition or a salt bridge giving or on the other electrode system we have cd2 positive and cd now both of them are one molar so they are standard electrodes now if we go to the electrochemical series which we have seen in the previous slide we can see that cadmium has a reduction potential of minus 0.4 volt zinc has a reduction potential of minus 0.76 volt so we have e0 of cell will be equal to e0 of right hand electrode minus e0 of left hand electrode right hand electrode is cadmium left hand electrode is zinc always the electrode which is undergoing oxidation is shown on left hand side the electrode which is undergoing or which is having a, a, a reduction reaction is always shown on right hand side so e0 of r minus e0 l will be equal to minus 0.40 minus of minus 0.76 that is equal to 0.36 volt now this is a clear indication that we can calculate the emf of this cell just by the literature values of our e0 values given in the electrochemical series that is an important application of the electrochemical series so this we have seen for this particular uh, redox couple of zinc and cadmium this we can apply for large number of other couples second application is we can predict the spontaneity of the redox reaction now in order to determine spontaneity of a redox reaction a cell involving that reaction is considered and the emf of that particular cell is calculated using the electrochemical series now if the emf is positive the reaction is spontaneous under standard condition and if it is negative the reaction is non spontaneous we will see with an example if we want to or we want to predict whether a reaction of al <clears throat> with ag positive to give you al3 positive and ag this is a redox reaction where aluminum is undergoing oxidation and silver is undergoing reduction will the reaction will take place spontaneously or not under uh, standard conditions now for that we construct a cell where al undergoing oxidation so oxidation um, half cell is on left hand side reduction half cell on right hand side so al in contact with al3 positive separated by porous partition or a salt bridge and ag positive in contact with ag now for this particular electrode we can calculate e0 of cell is e0 of right hand electrode minus e0 of left hand electrode that is equal to 0.8 minus of minus 1.66 now e0 of right hand electrode is our ag ag uh, positive system and left hand electrode is al al3 plus system for these two systems we take the values from electrochemical series and we can calculate e0 of cell is equal to 2.46 volt now it clearly indicates that the value is positive and so the process is spontaneous another example if we have al3 positive with zinc now will the reaction take place spontaneously or not al3 positive plus zinc giving you al and zinc 2 positive this is the reaction balanced reaction is twice al3 positive plus thrice zinc we are getting twice al plus thrice zn2 positive construct a cell where you have zn zn2 positive is a system which is a, a oxidation half cell whereas al3 positive al which is a reduction half cell on right hand side <clears throat> let us calculate the e0 of cell e0 of right hand electrode minus e0 of left hand electrode aluminum has minus 1.66 minus of zinc is minus 0.76 so minus of minus so this comes out to be equal to minus 0.9 volt now it clearly indicates that the process is non spontaneous so we can see that there are two reactions in this case the process is spontaneous as e0 of cell is equal to positive in this case the e0 of cell is coming out to be negative indicating that the process is non spontaneous but interestingly if we reverse this reaction if we have zn2 positive plus al giving you zn plus al3 positive 
for the exactly opposite reaction the two electrode system will be on opposite sides and this value will come out to be plus 0.9 volt and in that case we will say that this reaction is a spontaneous process so the reaction is non spontaneous in this direction but spontaneous in the opposite direction so we can predict the spontaneity of any redox process on the basis of electrochemical series under standard conditions third important application is we can predict the oxidizing and reducing agents now just now we have seen what is oxidizing agent and what is a reducing agent oxidizing agent is a species which oxidizes the other while reducing agent is a species which reduces the other now the species which are on the top of the series are good oxidizing agents and those at the bottom of the series they are good reducing agent for example fluorine is a good oxidizing agent while lithium lithium is the good reducing agent because we know that fluorine is present on the top of the series while lithium is present at the bottom of the series so all the elements which are at the bottom they are good reducing agents all the elements which are present at the top they are oxidizing agents one more application is in the displacement reaction the species present on the lower side displaces the species which are present on the higher side of the series from its solution for example zinc is present below copper and so we can say that zinc will displace copper from the solution of cu2 positive since zinc lies below copper in the electrochemical series so just by observing the electrochemical series we can predict which element can displace the other element from the solution of its ions now let us see how to balance a redox reaction there are two methods uh, for this one is called as a ion electron method and second is called as the oxidation number method both the methods will lead to the same type of balancing of the redox reaction uh, being simple we will be discussing here how to balance a redox reaction by using ion electron method for this first we have to divide the reaction into two half reactions the oxidation reaction and the reduction reaction secondly in oxidation reaction will balance all the atoms except hydrogen and oxygen thirdly if the reaction is taking place in acidic or neutral medium we have to balance the oxygen atoms with h2o molecules hydrogen atoms with h plus ions and charges with electrons while if the reaction is taking place in basic medium <clears throat> then we have to balance the oxygen atoms with oh minus ions that is two oh minus ions because oxygen atom have to be put in with two oh minus ions so that we can adjust accordingly the excess hydrogen atoms which are being incorporated by oh minus ions by one h2o molecule on the opposite side then balance hydrogen atoms by oh minus ions and charges with electrons that we will see how to uh, do it with a proper example then multiply both the half reactions with suitable number in order to balance the number of electrons and add both half reactions to get the balanced redox reaction these are the rules for balancing a redox reaction let us take an example let us try to balance the redox reaction H2S plus HNO3 giving you NO plus S plus H2O. This is a reaction, and we have to balance this redox reaction. Now, what is a redox reaction? Why is it a redox reaction? Because we can see that <clears throat> what is the oxidation state of sulfur over here? Oxidation state of sulfur is minus two because both the hydrogen atoms are in plus one oxidation state. So, from minus two, it is going to elemental state. the oxidation state is equal to 0 so from minus 2 to 0 is oxidation of sulfur now hno3 has hydrogen in plus 1 oxidation state <clears throat> three oxygen atoms in minus 2 each so six negative charges so in order to balance the six negative charges we need to have six positive out of that one positive is uh, given up by h positive so remaining five are coming from nitrogen so what is the oxidation state of nitrogen is plus five and nitrogen is forming a compound no here so nitrogen 
<clears throat> with oxygen. Oxygen is minus 2, so N has to be plus 2. So nitrogen is going from plus 5 to plus 2. So it means that nitrogen is undergoing reduction. So sulfur undergoing oxidation, nitrogen undergoing reduction. So it's a redox reaction. Let us try to balance this. For this, we can see that it has two half reactions. One is an oxidation reaction and second is a reduction reaction. Oxidation reaction is H2S giving you sulfur while reduction reaction is HNO3 that is NO3 negative giving you NO. This is the reaction which is going on. Okay, now balancing the oxidation reaction by hydrogen because now we are having hydrogen and since it is in the presence of acid, so it is in acidic condition. So let us balance the hydrogen atoms with H plus ions and charges with electrons. There are no oxygen atoms in this particular process. So balancing the H2S giving you S plus twice H positive. But now the charges are not balanced. So in order to balance only the charges, we have to add electrons on the right hand side. So the balanced oxidation reaction is H2S giving you S plus twice H positive plus two electrons. This is, I will call it as equation number one. Now, balancing the reduction reaction as we are having on reduction reaction, we are having oxygen atoms. There are three oxygen atoms here and only one oxygen atom here. So we have to add, since it is a uh, process in acidic medium, we have to balance the oxygen atoms with H2O molecules. So we will add H2O molecules on the right hand side and for whatever is the compensation of H plus are to be put on left hand side. So for that, what we do is we put NO3 negative giving you NO. Now there are there is a deficit of two oxygen atoms. So we will add two H2O molecules on the right hand side. But now it is again it is not balanced because there are four hydrogen atoms excess on the right hand side. So we will add four H plus ions on left hand side, but still it is not balanced because the atoms are balanced, but the charges are not balanced. So in order to balance the charges, we will add three electrons on left hand side. Now the uh, process of reduction is also balanced. So NO3 negative plus four H positive plus three electrons giving you NO plus twice H2O. Now this um, oxidation reaction is also balanced. The reduction reaction is also balanced. So now we can add these two together. So I take equation number one and equation number two. Now in order to add and cancel the number of electrons, I will have to multiply the equation number one by three and equation number two by two. And then we will add them together so that the number of electrons are cancelled. So if we multiply this equation number one by three, what we get is thrice H2S giving you thrice sulfur plus six H plus ions plus six electrons and multiplying equation number two by two, we get twice NO3 negative plus eight H plus ions plus six electrons giving you twice NO plus four H2O. The six electrons, six electrons will get cancelled and what we will get is thrice H2S plus twice NO3 negative plus now six H plus are on right hand side, eight H plus are on left hand side, only two H plus ions are remaining, giving you three S plus twice NO plus four H2O. Or in other words, if we combine these two together, what we get is thrice H2S plus twice HNO3, giving you thrice S plus twice NO plus four times H2O. This is the balanced redox reaction uh, which assignment has been given to us. So this is how we can balance any redox reaction in acidic medium. Uh, we will take one more example in acidic medium. Consider a common reaction of potassium dichromate with oxalic acid. So dichromate ion <coughs> reacting with oxalate ion in the presence of acidic medium giving you chromium in the plus three oxidation state. Now, in case of dichromate, just now we have seen that chromium is in plus six oxidation state. So chromium is undergoing reduction from plus six to plus three oxidation state. In case of uh, this oxalate ion, the carbon is undergoing oxidation <coughs> to 
plus 4 oxidation state in CO2 plus 4 H2. So it's a redox reaction. Now in this case, what is the oxidation half reaction and what is the reduction half reaction? Now reduction, uh, sorry, oxidation half reaction is oxidation of this oxalate ion to give you CO2 while reduction process is dichromate is getting reduced to chromium 3 plus. So these are the two half reactions. Now we have to balance both of them. Now first let us balance the oxidation reaction. What is the deficit or what is the difference between these two? So first we will balance the carbon atoms. So for carbon atoms we will uh, add or multiply it by 2 on right hand side. So what we are getting is C2O4 2 minus giving you twice CO2 but the charges are not balanced. The atoms are balanced completely. So in order to balance the charges, we will have to add two electrons on the right hand side. So this equation is easily balanced just by adding electrons. But the reduction process is different. There are number of oxygen atoms. So for oxygen atoms and for chromium atoms, first we will multiply this by two so that the number of chromium atoms are balanced so that Cr2O7 2 negative giving you twice CR3 positive. So chromium atoms are balanced but the oxygen atoms are to be balanced. Now we know that oxygen atoms are balanced by adding uh, H2O molecules in neutral or acidic medium while uh, when we add seven H2O molecules the oxygen atoms are also balanced but at the same time we are introducing four uh, hydrogen atoms there. So for four uh, sorry 14 hydrogen atoms over there. So we will add a 14 H positive on left hand side. Now all the atoms are balanced and in order to balance the charges we need to add 6 electrons on left hand side because the total charges on this are 2 negative, 14 positive but on the right hand side there are only 6 positive charges of uh, the 2 chromium 3 positive ions. So for that we will have to add 6 electrons on left hand side. Now both the oxidation and reduction reactions are completely balanced. Now after balancing this we can add them but only precaution we need to take is that we have to make the electrons equal. So in order to make the electrons equal we will multiply equation 1 by 3 and then we will add equation 2 to that. So multiplying equation 1 with 3 and adding it to equation 2 what we get is multiplying this equation by 3 we get thrice of the oxalate ions plus 6 times CO2 <clears throat> plus 6 electrons plus now we are adding this equation. So 6 electrons, 6 electrons will get cancelled and we have the balanced equation as 3 molecules of oxalate ions or 3 oxalate ions plus Cr2O7 2 negative plus 14 H positive giving you twice Cr3 positive plus 7 water molecules plus 6 CO2. Now this is completely balanced redox reaction. Now let us balance a redox reaction in basic medium now. Now the rules slightly change in basic medium because instead of H2O we have to add OH negative here. So reaction is CrOH3 plus IO3 negative that is a iodate ion giving you iodide plus CrO4 2 negative. Now chromium is in plus 3 oxidation state here while here chromium is in plus 6 oxidation state. So chromium is undergoing oxidation. At the same time iodine is in uh, plus 5 oxidation state here. It is undergoing reduction to give iodide which is in minus 1 oxidation state. Okay, let us try to balance this e equation. So we split it into two equations oxidation process and reduction process. Oxidation of CrOH3 to CrO4 to negative and reduction of IO3 negative to iodide. Let us balance one by one. So in case of this we have CrO4 to negative and CrOH3. Now in that case <clears throat> we will have to add OH minus ions to this in order to balance the number of oxy oxygen atoms and we know that OH minus ions are always added in multiples of 2 because we have to balance the hydrogen simultaneously. So let us try this CrOH3 on left hand side CrO4 2 negative on right hand side we will add 2 OH minus ions on this side 
and a H2O molecule on this side. So now what we have is CrO so oxygen atoms we, we are trying to balance. So now there are there is uh, there are three oxygen atoms from here and two oxygen atoms from here. So five oxygen atoms and now on right hand side also there are five oxygen atoms. So oxygen atoms are completely balanced. But what is what, what about hydrogen? Now there are how many hydrogen atoms are there? There is uh, there is a hydrogen atom. There are two hydrogen atoms over here. Whereas on left hand side we are having five hydrogen atoms. So we will have to add hydrogen atoms now. So for that we add uh, six hydrogen atoms in terms of H2O molecule and at the same time we subtract three hydrogen atoms on this side in terms of OH minus ions. So we add three H2O molecules here and we remove three OH minus ions because oxygen we do not want to balance. So oxygen are to be removed equally. Now if we add these together what we get is CrOH3 plus 5OH minus plus CrO4 2 negative plus 4 H2O molecules and now in order to balance the charges we will have to add 3 electrons on this side. So now the, uh, the process of oxidation is completely balanced. Coming to the uh, balancing of the reduction reaction. Now for reduction we are having IO3 negative giving you iodide. Now for that we will add now we have O3 so we will add 6 OH minus and remove 3 H2O or, on, or rem, add 3 H2O on the opposite side. So what we get is IO3 negative plus thrice H2O giving you iodide plus 6 OH minus and the charges are balanced with 6 H uh, sorry 6 electrons. Now we have both the oxidation and reduction reactions which are balanced. We will add them by multiplying because there are 3 electrons here and we have 6 electrons here. So we will have to multiply it by 2 and then add it. So what we get is twice CrOH3 plus 4 times OH minus plus IO3 negative giving you twice CrO4 2 negative plus iodide plus 5H2O. Now this is a balanced redox reaction between chromium 3 plus and iodate ion. Now uh, the last portion of this particular topic is the principles which are involved in volumetric type of analysis which is to be carried out as a lab work or lab experiment or in your lab course. Now what is meant by a volumetric analysis? Volumetric analysis is a classical method of analysis which is also called as titrimetric type of analysis because it involves titration. It has titration of unknown concentration of the analyte which is generally called as a titrand and it is titrated with a standard reagent called as a titrant. Analyte is any species in the sample which is to be estimated or which is to be analyzed and it is titrated with a standard reagent called as a titrant. Now the concentration of analyte is determined from the concentration as well as volume of the titrant required to just neutralize the analyte. An indicator is used to locate the equivalence point between the titrant and the titrant. The entire process is called as a titration phenomena. There are four types of titrations. First is the neutralization titration or commonly called as acid based titration where we titrate or we determine the unknown concentration of an acid by titrating it with standard base or a vice versa that is the unknown concentration of a base by titrating with standard acid. Second are the redox type of titrations where we carry out a titration of a unknown reducing agent with a standard oxidizing agent or unknown uh, concentration of a, an oxidizing agent with a standard reducing agent solution. Third type of titrations are the precipitation titration where we carry out a titration of two completely soluble salts to give a sparingly soluble salt. And in case of a fourth type that is a complexometric titration, we carry out titration of some metal ion with some ligand to form a complex or vice versa titration of some ligand solution with a standard metal ion solution to form a complex. So these are the four types of titrations normally uh, are the part of our laboratory work. 
Among them, since this is a topic based on the reduction and oxidation phenomena, we will be discussing various redox type of titrations that are a part of your curriculum in BSc semester 1 lab course. So, there are four important uh, experiments which are there as a part of your syllabus. First experiment is estimation of oxalic acid by titrating with standard KMnO4 solution. Second experiment is estimation of water of crystallization in Mohr salt by titrating with KMnO4. Third is the estimation of Fe2 positive ions by titrating with standard K2Cr2O7 using an internal indicator. And fourth experiment is estimation of Cu2 positive ions iodometrically using sodium thiosulfate standard solution. Okay, so let us start with the first experiment that is estimation of oxalic acid by titrating with KMnO4. Now this titration is having oxalic acid as a unknown solution or oxalic acid of unknown concentration is taken and to this half test tube of sulfuric acid, dilute sulfuric acid is added. Now since the reaction is to be carried out in acidic medium, the acidic medium is maintained by non-reacting acid that is sulfuric acid and it has to be titrated with standard KMnO4 solution which is filled in a, in a burette. Now this reaction uh, can be shown as KMnO4 reacting with H or in the presence of H2SO4 reacting with oxalic acid to give you K2SO4 plus MnSO4 plus 18 molecules of H2O plus CO2. Now if we see this reaction carefully, we can see that manganese is in plus 7 oxidation state on left hand side, manganese in plus 2 oxidation state on the right hand side. So manganese is undergoing reduction from plus 7 to plus 2 oxidation state whereas carbon is undergoing oxidation from we are having COOH, COOH. So this oxalate ions carbon is undergoing oxidation to plus 4 oxidation state in CO2. Now this reaction requires elevated temperature because the reaction is slow. Initially, the reaction is very slow and so in order to increase the rate of reaction, we have to increase the temperature or we have to heat the oxalic acid solution to about 60 to 70 degrees Celsius and then it is titrated with KMnO4 standard solution. Now this standard KMnO4 solution is added in a dropwise manner in the uh, oxalic acid solution with constant stirring or swelling of the solution. Now when this is continuously added, at a particular point, the color changes to pink, which is called as the end point. Now, there is no external indicator required because KMnO4 itself is a, is a self indicator. Since the solution is very dark solution, when uh, the oxalic acid is completely neutralized, the next drop of KMnO4 imparts a distinct pink color to the entire solution and as soon as this uh, pink color is obtained, <clears throat> we need to stop the titration process and we have to record the volume of standard KMnO4 solution required and from the volume of KMnO4 solution required from the uh, concentration of KMnO4 and from the volume of oxalic acid taken, we can calculate the concentration of oxalic acid uh, mathematically. Another experiment is based on estimation of water of crystallization in Mohr salt by titrating with KMnO4. Now Mohr salt is a common name for a compound called as ferrous ammonium sulphate. Again, since it's a titration, but this titration involves two titrations. The first titration is titration of ferrous sulphate with KMnO4. The, in this case, we have to take standard ferrous sulphate solution which is 0 0.05 normal and uh, approximately 0 0.05 normal KMnO4. The reactions which are involved are KMnO4 reacting with ferrous sulphate and the net reaction is given over here. Ionic reaction is MnO4 negative is getting converted to Mn2 positive and Fe2 plus is getting oxidized to Fe3 positive. Now, this is one uh, titration that is to be carried out. There is second titration is with actual ferrous ammonium sulfate or the Mohr salt. About 20 gram per liter solution of FAS is exactly prepared. Now the reaction between these two is again the same. We have Fe2 plus getting converted to Fe3 plus 
Only difference is instead of FeSO4, we are having the ferrous uh, ammonium sulfate with number of water molecules. And there are six, actually there are six water molecules, but that we have to determine experimentally. We will consider this as X number of H2O molecules. And the aim of the titration is to determine the value of X. Now, the titration is same. We have to take the known volume of either FeSO4 solution or FAS solution. So first we will take FeSO4 solution, titrate with KMnO4. Then we will take FAS solution and titrate with KMnO4. Now again, the titration is to be carried out, but in that case, we do not need to increase the temperature because the reaction between Fe2 positive and KMnO4 is a fast reaction. And so it does not require the elevated temperature. We have to carry out the titration either with FeSO4 or FAS till we get a distinct pink color because of the self indicator, which is KMnO4. And from the volume of this KMnO4 required, we can calculate the normalities. So let the normality of the FAS solution as obtained from the titration is equal to N. Now we know that normality multiplied by the equivalent weight is the strength in gram per liter. So strength in gram per liter will be equal to N into the equivalent weight of the compound. Now if the compound is anhydrous as FeSO4, NH4 twice SO4 with no water of hydration, then the equivalent weight of this compound will be equal to its molecular weight, which is equal to 284. Now in that case, equivalent weight is equal to molecular weight because this is actually, this compound is having Fe2 positive, which is capable of accepting, uh, giving out only one electron. And so the N factor is equal to one. And we know that equivalent weight is equal to molecular weight divided by the N factor and the N factor is equal to one. So equivalent weight will be same as the molecular weight. So it has to be theoretically equal to 284. Now, if so, the strength of this compound will be equal to our strength of the solution will be N into 284 gram per liter. But if the compound is hydrated with X number of water molecules, then the strength will be equal to N multiplied by 284 plus 18X. Why 18X? Because X is the number of water molecules and 18 is the molecular weight of each water molecule. So the total molecular weight of the compound will be equal to 284 plus 18 into X. This is the strength of the uh, hydrated salt in terms of gram per liter. However, the actual solution which we have prepared is 20 gram per liter. So we can put an equation that equivalent weight of hydrated salt will be directly proportional to strength of the hydrated salt and equivalent weight of anhydrous salt will be directly proportional to strength of anhydrous salt. So we can put the values over here in the form of a ratio that 284 plus 18x is the equivalent weight of hydrated salt divided by 284 that is the equivalent weight of anhydrous salt will be equal to strength of the hydrated salt which we have already prepared is equal to 20 gram per liter because the solution is prepared by us divided by strength of the anhydrous salt is equal to N into 284. Now, putting all those values, the normality of the solution which we have already obtained, putting the value of N, we can get the value of X, which is equal to 20 divided by N minus 284 divided by 18. And this value of X comes out to be 6 for FAS salt. So we can determine how many water of hydration are there in FAS salt. Third experiment is estimation of Fe2 positive ions by titrating with potassium dichromate solution. Now potassium dichromate is not a self indicator because the solution of potassium dichromate is faint orange in color like this. So since it is an orange colored solution, uh, it cannot impart a distinct color at the end point. So we need to add or we need to add some internal indicator. And a common indicator used is N-phenylanthranilic acid in this case. So we have Fe2 positive ion solution. The known volume of Fe2 plus solution whose concentration is to be determined is taken in a conical flask. And to that, five drops of N-phenylanthranilic acid internal indicator is added. Now, when it is added, the solution gets and then it is titrated with uh, K2Cr2O7 solution. 
Now, as soon as first drop of K2Cr2O7 solution is added, now N phenylanthanic acid is colorless in the reduced state. But as soon as first drop of K2Cr2O7 is added, the chromium gets reduced from chromium plus 6 to chromium plus 3. And chromium plus 3 is faint green in color. So the solution becomes pale green in color as soon as the first drop of K2Cr2O7 solution is added. Then when the titration is continued, at the end point, the colorless benzenoid form of the N-phenylanthranilic acid, which is normally dimerized form, is getting converted into quinonoid form. And quinonoid form is distinctly violet in color. And because of this, at the end point, color changes to violet from the faint green color of chromium 3 positive ions. So this is how we can immediately detect the end point. And from the volume of the K2Cr2O7 solution required, we can calculate what is the concentration of Fe2 plus in the solution. The last experiment is the estimation of Cu2 positive ions iodometrically using sodium thiosulfate. Now copper directly reacting with Na2S2O3 uh, does not lead to any clear cut indication of the end point. For that, there is an indirect method of iodometry is uh, used. Now iodometry is a special type of titration where we use Ki as a, an intermediate. Now this Ki reacts with CuSO4 and it gets converted into cupric iodide and K2SO4. Now this cupric iodide is highly unstable and it gets converted into stable cuprous iodide releasing iodine. Now this iodine is actually titrated with sodium thiosulfate solution which is normally called as a hypo solution of con uh, a known concentration and on this uh, it's a redox titration between the liberated iodine. Now this iodine is liberated from Ki. Such type of titrations are called as iodometric titrations where the liberated iodine is titrated with sodium thiosulfate. If the iodine is directly used for titration, then that particular titration will be called as a iodimetric titration. That is the fundamental difference between iodometric and iodimetric titration. In case of iodometry, the liberated iodine is titrated and the liberation source is Ki. In case of iodimetry, the directly iodine solution is used for titration. Now, it's a, as it is an indirect titration through iodine, for detection of iodine, the best indicator is a starch indicator. For actual titration, known volume of copper solution is taken and to that 5 ml of 10% Ki solution is added. Now when Ki is added, it liberates iodine. Now to that solution, about 1 ml of starch indicator is added. Now starch forms a colored complex or a deep blue colored complex with iodine and the solution becomes a deep blue in color. Now it is titrated with standard sodium thiosulfate solution. When the titration is carried out, the iodine which is there undergoes reduction back to iodide. At the end point, whatever is the, iod the complex of iodine formed with starch is completely converted or the iodine from the complex is extracted back and the color changes from deep blue to colorless. So this is taken as the end point of the titration. This is how from the volume of standard sodium thiosulfate required in the titration, we can determine how much of copper is present in the given solution. So this is how we can carry out the redox titrations. These are the four titrations as per the syllabus of BSc semester one. This is all about this paper of BSc semester one inorganic chemistry honors course chemistry and that inorganic chemistry paper we have completed in about 15 hours of the lectures discussing atomic structure, periodic properties, then nature of chemical bonding, various theories of the bonding and in the end oxidation and reduction. Thank you. Thank you very much from Professor Ravin Zugade from Department of Chemistry, 
राष्ट्रसंत तुकडोजी महाराज नागपूर युनिव्हर्सिटी थँक्यू